Welcome to Cancer Newsline, a podcast series from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Cancer Newsline helps you stay current with the news on cancer research, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, providing the latest information on reducing your family's cancer risk. I'm your host, Lisa Garvin, and today we have a special podcast because we have three people in the studio. Our subject today is brain cancer. My first guest is Dr. Amy Heimberger. She is an associate professor of neurosurgery here at MD Anderson. My second guest is Lainey Rose, who is the founder for the Run for the Rose, which is a run to raise funds for brain cancer research. Our third guest is Gail Goodwin, who is the program manager for communications here at MD Anderson and also a three-year survivor of brain cancer. So welcome, ladies. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think we'll start with you, Dr. Heimberger. Let's talk about, well, Gail's um, diagnosis as well as Lainey's daughter's diagnosis was oligodendroglioma. What type of brain cancer is that? Cancers of the brain are classified in by the World Health Organization, and there's four different grades. Grade one is a very benign, usually can be treated with surgery alone. Grade twos can consist of things like oligodendrogliomas or a low-grade infiltrating astrocytoma. Again, many times surgery is the preferred choice, although in some cases, if it's not surgically treatable, sometimes these patients get chemo or radiation. Grade three, usually people know it by the name anaplastic astrocytoma. These are more aggressive types of tumors. You can't fix them necessarily with surgery. A lot of these folks need surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And then the most malignant type of primary glioma type of tumor goes by the name of glioblastoma multiform or glioblastoma. That grade four tumor is a, is a highly invasive highly malignant type of malignancy. Although the most common type of brain tumor in adults is a benign tumor called a meningioma, which is a a tumor of the covering of the brain, the most common type of glioma in adult patients is a malignant glioma, i.e. glioblastoma multiforme. And typically with brain tumors, there's really no familial connection and really no identifiable risk factors. Aren't they pretty sporadic? 95% of the time, yeah. They're absolutely completely sporadic. It's not anything that any patient has done. It's not because they've been, you know, they've taken a fall. It's not because of something they've done. There are some rare types of gliomas that are familial, but usually the folks come in with a history, mom had a brain tumor, dad had a brain tumor, three sisters had a brain tumor. In that scenario, we typically get a geneticist and an epidemiologist involved to evaluate that family cluster. But the vast majority of the cases, we don't know what causes this. We don't think there's anything anybody has done that has caused this or triggered this. Now, there's a lot of studies that are underway, and people have heard of controversial stories about the cell phone. Does that trigger malignant tumors? The verdict is not is not back in yet. We don't know the answer. The World Health Organization has listed cell phones as a possible cause, but there's no data that says, yes, absolutely, we know for a fact that that's the reason. And for every study that you could produce in front of me that says, yes, it causes brain cancer, I could produce an equally valid study that says, no, they do not. Before this, there was question of, uh, you know, electrical power lines. There was a series of studies way back 20, 30 years ago about them being a cause for brain cancers. Petroleum or exposures to certain chemicals, certain radiations, all of these have been at various points in time in the literature as possible causes, but really the answer comes down to we don't know what causes these in the vast majority of the cases. We understand some of the genes that are behind it, but we don't understand why these genes go awry. And are there any commonalities on the people who are diagnosed in terms of age, gender, or race? For the high-grade malignant gliomas, the glioblastoma multiform, the one that everyone fears, they are more common in Caucasian population. No one really understands why, but the vast majority are. And there's a little bit of a male preponderance of high-grade malignant gliomas. It's very close, though. Very, very, it's almost 50-50, so we're talking very slight differences in um in sex as far as the predisposition to these. Now, in the case of meningiomas, remember I mentioned that those were tumors of the covering over the brain. Women are a little bit more likely to have those compared to men, but more likely Caucasians. And typically, I know in Gail's case, she was stage three at diagnosis. It's pretty typical to catch them in advanced stages. 
You know, it's various. It varies. You know, some folks, you know, they get in a motor vehicle accident. Just they, lucky. <laughs> yeah, they get a CT for some reason. Um, I stopped talking. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> everyone who knows me knows that was an indication <laughs> something, something was, was wrong. drastically <laughs> wrong. You weren't chatting. <laughs> right. <laughs> Other folks can become symptomatic. It depends on the location. It's all about the real estate. Location, location, location. Left frontal lobe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So left frontal area would be um, an area of the brain called Brokos, mm -hmm. and that's an area that produces speech. So if the tumor is nearby, invading, or pressing on that area, yes, yeah, someone can present with problems with their speech. Depends on the location. Sometimes tumors can be in the motor area, uh, an area of the brain that moves the arm or the leg. So sometimes folks come mm -hmm. in with, you know, a weak arm. Sometimes they come in with incoordination if it's in, located in their coordination center. Sometimes they just present with headaches first thing in the morning. Sometimes those headaches wake them up in the middle of the night. These are kind of warning signs. It's very typical for most people to have headaches. I mean, most of the population has a headache at one point or another. And I think everybody worries, oh my gosh, do I have a brain tumor? The, the signs that we really look for as a neurosurgeon is when someone comes in and says, you know, it's waking me up in the middle of the night, or I wake up with this headache first thing in the morning, and then as I stand up and walk around, it gets better. Those are sort of the warning signs that we become a little bit more cautious and our ears perk up when we hear that from someone. As you go through your day and the day gets, you know, stressful or whatever, you know, the job, you're pulling out your hair, a lot of times those are more attention headaches related to work or stress. So when folks say, oh, you know, it happens, you know, about, you know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon after a hard day of computer work, I get a little less worried or concerned. It, other times, folks can have things like seizures as their main presenting mm -hmm. symptoms. But I got to tell you, there's been a lot of folks that I've seen over the years that just come in because someone told them they got a head CT for whatever reason. Occasionally, I've had folks that have gotten one just for fun or for a research study, like students. They've gone in as a control for you know a research study, and all of a sudden, they show up at MD Anderson saying, they say, I have something in my head. I had no idea. Now, Gail, if I remember the story right, you were actually sitting at your desk at work, and somebody came in and noticed you were looking not right. Tell us about not that. Not quite like that. I came in. It was just a normal day, and I drove in on the freeway, for heaven's sake, which kind of scares me. Uh, I got to the office and sat down, and a few minutes later, one of my colleagues came in, and she offices across the hall from me, and she two times called out to me, and asked if I was ready to go to a meeting that we had. And I didn't respond. And so she walked across the hall and she said, really, we have a meeting. Are you ready to go? And I just smiled at her. She said, okay, either this is a really bad <laughs> April Fool's joke, because it was April 1st, or I need to call the ambulance. And I just smiled and she called the ambulance. <laughs> Now, uh, and so you were diagnosed right away. Uh, yes, they took me to Memorial Hermann, actually, because they thought I'd had a stroke. And uh, my husband came and he said, he, I thought I went immediately to a room, but he said, no, I, I didn't get into a room until that afternoon. But they did a CAT scan and called him in and said, uh, boy, this doesn't look good. You know, we're so sorry. And then I had an MRI later that day. And then I came back to MD Anderson in two days, immediately met with uh, my surgeon and my oncologist. And two weeks later, it was almost all gone. In retrospect, looking back in, in some of the symptoms that Dr. Heimberger mentioned, would you have noticed it come up earlier? Did you have these nagging symptoms and maybe blew them off? I've had headaches my entire life, but my grandfather had them, my mother had them, and I asked after I was diagnosed, and I told them that I'd always had headaches, and they said it had nothing to do with this. Uh, they said it was very slow growing. Uh, they didn't know when it started. Uh, was about the size of a lemon when they took it out. I know. Can you imagine having a lemon in your head? Ooh. <laughs> anyway, uh, but there, Dr. Uh, Weinberg was my surgeon, and he, he got all he told me, he assured me, except for about 15%. And so uh, my friends ask him to leave my personality intact, and <laughs> hopefully it's still there. <laughs> and, and Lainey, your daughter Marnie Rose was a doctor, and 
TV viewers may remember her from a show called Houston Medical, where her disease was actually front and center as part of the story. What was that like for you as a mother, but also seeing, having everyone else in on your daughter's journey? It, it provided a wonderful distraction for Marnie and, and actually for us too. Otherwise, um, you obsess over the brain tumor and worry about everything 24 hours a day. Um, but it was horrible at the same time because we really felt like we had to hide our emotions. Or, But we would have done that anyway um, rather than maybe show Marnie how horrified we were. Um, but it, it was a time we felt that it was very important for people to see that these these brain tumors were not happening just to older men. They were happening to young adults with their lives ahead of them and with no risk factors. And it seems like the show really became kind of an awareness campaign. Yes. yes. And um, now tell me about the progression of your daughter's disease. It was fairly fast, was it not? Yes, it was. And how was it for her as a doctor knowing what was going on up there? I think we all had hope that Marnie would be the one person that would survive. And we never gave up that hope. But I, I think also we, we knew that it might not end that way. And Marnie lived a year and a half, which really was just about as long as anyone 10 years ago lived. And so how did the run for the rose, was there a run for the rose before she passed or did this happen afterwards? No, it, it happened right afterwards. And how, how has that gone? I mean, it seems like it's been quite a success and it builds every year. It's been an amazing success because people in the community have supported us. People in the medical community, people that saw Marnie on TV, people just have, have decided to... Um, that, that we're doing a good job at, at what we're doing. And they're amazed to see the difference now um, in the survival rates of, of some brain tumor patients. And um, anyway, we started the first run. My sons were worried that it would only be the four of us there. <laughs> and, but we had 1,800 people. And now this year we're expecting over 5000 and that we will net over a half a million dollars just from this just year's from this rate. run and, and that and then we will have given over 3 million dollars to our two hospitals that's wonderful in 10 years and, and now are you your money is going towards specific types of research or what what are you hoping to fund with these monies yes we specify that we want to fund research that offers the hope for a cure. And um, we have funded Dr. Heimberger's research since about 2005 or 2006. And we funded the Delta 24 before that. And, and we fund some new drug development and all. We try to give large sums of money to a few researchers. And let's talk about some of these things that we're doing. Generally, when I think of brain cancer treatment, I think of surgery. Mm -hmm. But it looks like, you know, you're talking about Delta 24 and other cancer vaccines. Talk about this role of non-surgical treatments for brain cancer. As I mentioned, that with the anaplastic astrocytoma, grade threes, grade fours, surgery isn't enough. These tumors come back, they regrow. We also have to remember that sometimes we're very lucky that we have a tumor, it's in a location, we can get out. But there's many times that I see somebody that we can't offer them a resection. Uh, it is very common in pediatric patients, young children, where they can have a glioma in their brainstem, and you simply can't do anything with that. So we know that surgery is not enough. And in fact, for a while, there was even a big discussion in the neurosurgical community of whether surgery was even of a benefit in high-grade gliomas as far as survival. So that was a long, ongoing debate for quite a while. The idea behind a lot of these therapeutics is that we need to understand that in the United States, there, as far as pharma is concerned, you know, big pharmaceutical companies, they want to see a return on their investment. 
And since you have patients that have malignant gliomas, it's not as big a business as, let's say, lung cancer patients. So you're looking at, you know, maybe 20,000 patients per year with malignant tumors in the United States. And that's in comparison to a very large number of patients with lung cancer or breast cancer. So if you develop something specifically for glioma patients, it really has to be a gigantic blockbuster, probably even crossing over into other types of treatment for other malignancies for them to see return on their investment. So there really hasn't been for quite a while an interest in, in big pharma here in the United States to develop agents or drugs or approaches for this particular patient population. Now, there's some. Um, obviously, some companies have taken an interest in developing companies, uh, it, it, drugs, especially recently, uh, and approaches, but it's not universal. And many times what they select is based on the fact that they can use it in other types of malignancy. So there's this real need of patients. You know that the tumor is going to come back. You know surgery is not going to do the trick. You know that sometimes chemos do not do a great job in the brain as far as treating malignancies, and you know that they have a dismal survival. So you've got to do something to help folks, especially the pediatric patients, the young patients that are afflicted with these terrible malignancies, because it really takes, I mean, it takes their lives. It takes away sometimes their personality, their function, their ability to interact with their family. I mean, to take care of someone who has one of these that's impacting their lives. I mean, it's absolutely devastating, not only for that patient, but their family. So we have to do better here. And, I, you know, and, it se- and it's a good partnership made in mm-hmm. heaven with, with yes. the Run for the Rose and Laney Rose's efforts. And that's a part of the problem with rare cancers as well is getting that funding. Like you said, yes. Big Pharma's not interested in, you know, rare cancers. So Correct. this must have ha- – how has her fundraising helped your effort? Has it, like, moved it up a few years? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, so I think the best analogy would be that a lot of times you have a cool idea a neat idea or a neat sort of approach to how you might treat this. But you have to understand um, that the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Health, they want some data to say, okay, this has some possibility of working. And where do you get that data? Because they're not going to fund you until you actually generate that data. So it's really this chicken and an egg thing. You're like, okay, I've got this great idea, but how do I get this idea off the ground? I mean, how do I get this started? So really, you have to sort of almost find individuals unique and are willing to invest in your idea or or who you are as a person to give you that little bit of seed money. And then once that idea really starts blossoming, Then all of a sudden, people, you know, their ears perk up and, you know, all of a sudden now you do have the National Institute of Health. Oh, yeah, you've got some data. Oh, it's looking interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, we'll help support that. So it's a real synergy. So you need someone to come in at the very ground level. But finding those folks that are willing to take the big risk at the very beginning, that's tough. And there's very few foundations that really want to sort of support this kind of – they want to know that it's going to work for sure. Everybody kind of wants to know. But you have to have someone that takes that that chance. And that's what's really unique about the Dr. Marnie Rose Foundation is they kind of take a risk. They look at somebody and say, look, you know what? This is an interesting idea. It might just work. And that's how this whole peptide vaccine got started. This was an idea that came actually from mice being treated with a peptide vaccine, little mice with tumors in their heads. We treated them with a peptide vaccine. My partner at Duke, John Sampson, we sort of got this idea, well, why don't we do this in patients? And at the time, everybody was like, oh, immunotherapy against GBMs, not going to work. We've done this before. We did it in the 50s. It didn't work. Didn't work in the 60s. Didn't work in the 70s. No hope in heck that it's going to work. And we sort of pitched the idea to, you know, to Lainey Rose and, and said, you know, this is our idea. We had an extremely supportive chair um, in neurosurgery, Dr. Raymond Suwaya, who really said, you know what? She might be onto something. Look at this animal data. Al Young, also chair of the Department of Neuro-Oncology, also was very supportive of this endeavor. And so with that, they decided we're going to give you some money to help with the clinical trial. 
at the very beginning, before we had any data in any human being whatsoever. And I remember going around the clinics and kind of begging patients at the time, oh, please, you know, with a, you know we've got great mice data. But think about how hard it is to talk to someone for the very first time when all you've got is little pictures of mice and how well this worked in a mouse. But then they ask you the hard question, well, what about in humans? Um, well, you're going to be the first, or you might be the first. That's a hard decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes real guts for someone to I stand up. Some of you people come into the office when <laughs> yeah. I'm in there. <laughs> Would you like to sign off? <laughs> but it takes, it's really courageous folks, mm-hmm. really courageous patients that are willing to stand up and say, okay, I will try this. And also courageous folks you know, fundraisers say, okay, we're going to support this. But then after you get, you know, half a dozen patients on and all of a sudden, hey, look, this data is showing the mm-hmm. same thing is happening in the human patients as we saw in the mice. Then all of a sudden everybody's like, okay, now we're willing to help out. So, but again, you've got to have people that have got the, the vision to say, look, you know, we believe in this idea. We think this is cool. And Lainey, was it hard for you? Was it an uphill battle when you started the foundation to attract funding? and support? Oh, no. I have to say no. Hmm. Um, people just just supported us. They just gave us money. They, I was down in the lobby waiting um, today, and a woman can't recognize me and came up and wrote me a check. Um, people are so happy that our money goes directly to the patients, not for administrative costs. I've worked no. for free every year. Um, all year, um, b- people are happy to support us. We've we've had trouble with big corporations getting big corporations. We would love to do that, but the the public is just amazing and you generous. You all have been very visible, though, and you know everyone mm-hmm. kind of knew Marnie and knew uh-huh. her story and wanted to help. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember oh, when all yes. of that happened. Yes, and, uh, and there's something to be said for having a public face for the disease. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. And so, you know, I think Houston Medical, you know, told her story in such a compelling mm-hmm. way that she became kind of an icon. In yes, a way. absolutely. So um, let's talk about, you, you mentioned Delta 24, one of the things mm-hmm. that the foundation is funding. Let's mm-hmm. talk about Sounds that. Sounds like an airplane or something. <laughs> <laughs> or, or a fraternity. That was yeah. our first project. That was the first okay. thing we uh-huh. funded. That's not my specific area of research. <laughs> Mine was the peptide vaccine and a small molecule inhibitor. But that was developed by Juan Fieo. Charles Conrad mm-hmm. and Frederick Lane. Doctor. Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, and what it is is, and, and they probably would be the best to, and you know, to discuss it in depth since it's their area of expertise. But it is a virus that's specific for gliomas. It is now, after a lot of hard work on everybody that was involved with that, it is now in phase one slash two clinical trials, where they're actually treating patients now with the Delta twenty four. It is a virus that specifically attacks the malignant cells. We have actually now started developing a collaboration with them as well, looking at how the virus might modulate immunity as well. But that's very, very early, very, very preliminary data that we've just now started to begin. To begin. So there may be a role for us working together in the future in the synergy of immunotherapy with the viruses. Uh, but again, that's going to require a lot of new investigation, a lot of new data. But it's an area that we've, we've begun. So with these vaccines and immunotherapies and targeted mm-hmm. therapies coming online, do you foresee more research projects or more research pathways? Actually, there are several clinical trials that are getting ready to come online that are immunotherapeutic strategies specifically for GBM patients. Um, But in the future, I envision that what we will do is we will do a much greater molecular characterization of the tumor, and this will help us direct the therapeutics uh, specifically for the properties of any given tumor. So in the past, it's been very general. Surgery, irradiation, we kind of give you a sort of standard chemo. In the future, what I think will probably happen is when we take out that tumor, that's sort of the starting point where we'll look to see is there certain molecular pathways that are activated, and if so, you would be more predisposed to receiving a certain drug that targets and downmodulates those pathways? Do you have a certain immune sort of signature 
that's in that tumor. Does that mean you're, you're better suited for certain types of immunotherapy strategies as opposed to others? So I think that as we move forward, it's going to be much more patient-specific, and my hope is that we'll reduce a lot of the toxicity and side effects from sort of these very sort of global, nonspecific approaches that we've used in the past. And Gail is a three-year survivor now. Yes. Which That's is good wonderful, news. <laughs> yes. Um, what are your thoughts moving forward? You say there's still a little bit left in there. Um, how do you live life? Um, I, I try not to think about it, actually. I, uh, I have to every two months when I go to see my oncologist, when I go to have an MRI. I mean, it's, it's front of mind, of course. And you always wonder, what's he going to say the next day? I have the MRI, then I go see my doctor. Uh, you know, what's what's the result going to be? I wrote a blog post not long ago about you should never say things are boring because that's kind of the <laughs> stage where I am. And that's, that's kind of like knock on wood because you just don't know. But, um, I, you know, I, I'm real comfortable here at MD Anderson. I, I work here and I spend a lot of time here. I know that I have the best oncologists in the world helping me out. And so I feel pretty good about where I am. And Lainey, how do you feel? Do you feel like you've left a good legacy behind for your daughter? Yes, we certainly have. And um, I'd like to say that we have about 65 survivors signed up for the run this year. And some are four, five, six, seven years out um, with no end in sight, thank goodness. While at our first runs, we would, would have a survivor or two, but they wouldn't live until the next run. And these are people this year, the 65, a lot of them have had teams for years at our run. And so we're just thrilled. And we see the progress that research has made. And it's just amazing. Can you mention your website for people that want to know more? Oh, thank you. It's runfortherose.com. Great. Ladies, this is a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. like there is promise ahead for brain tumor treatment and Hope so. promise for our survivors as <laughs> well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. If you have questions about anything you've heard today on Cancer Newsline, contact AskMD Anderson at 1-877-MDA-6789 or online at www.mdanderson.org slash ask. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cancer Newsline. Tune in for the next podcast in our series.